Good evening. Please settle down. We are just starting a special plenary. An expert who has been doing detailed, deep tried research on different technologies being today talked about for decarbonization is going to a kajanda ka copy deva kya sab jagah kitab pada hai so is going to talk about it and since he couldn't uh, mr michael bernard he could not come physically he is going to deliver this uh, virtually सब लोगों को बाहर घंटी बने हो चल दम नोटिस चल दम बाहर नो बाहर भी लोग नोटिस चल दम ठीक टेस्ट वन हेलो हेलो ठीक ठीक टेस्ट वन हेलो यस बी सर जॉइंट यस जॉइंट आई ओके सर गिव इस पिक्चर एंड आल्सो दिस स्लाइड वेर इस द स्लाइड Good, good morning, Michael. Sincere apologies good morning. for the delay. Good afternoon. Sincere apologies for the That's delay. Okay. As usual, all conference run late, and this one ran unusually late. So about 45 minutes behind the schedule we are. Although I postponed the program from 5 o'clock to 5:45, <coughs> now it is 6:30, evening here in India, and um, 8 o'clock for you in uh, Toronto. So uh, I'll just give a short introduction about uh, what Michael is going to talk about is for 15 long years he has been doing deep research, analytical work on different technologies which we are currently being considered for decarbonization or energy transition. And the bottom line is that we don't, we don't know what will work. We all think that electrification will work. We strongly believe electrification will work. And during this COVID time, the more infectious than COVID was the love for hydrogen. Almost every, every second man on the street has become a hydrogen expert. And well, we, we had a session where we talked about uh, uh, standards and certification uh, for, and regulations for green hydrogen. So is that is the one which is going to actually work? Do we really need green hydrogen for decarbonization of the hard to abate sectors like steel, etc.? Today, 50, the, there are electric furnaces which run up to 1500 degrees centigrade, which is good enough for which is good enough for steel making. Why people are not using is because fuel is coal is still cheaper than electricity so when there is tax on coal and when there is uh, electricity is going to be attractive hydrogen will be still several times more expensive so is electrification <coughs> the only uh, uh, means for decarbonization we all think so and that is exactly what michael also thinks but this all decarbonization or energy transition going to have different uh, impact on different sectors. For example, I happened to read one of his paper, which I talked about recently. For, we, we are going to push coal out of the equation. When coal is not there in the mainstay, it's going to affect shipping industry in a very big way. 45 percentage of the total shipping volume today is coal. If that goes down, what will happen to the shipping industry? And another 15 to 20 percent is uh, basically uh, the, the oil and gas. And that will also drastically going to go down. Last year alone, we have only a, a, a fleet size of about 40 million, 40 million electric vehicles now. But last year in 2023, uh, 3 million barrels per day of oil consumption has <coughs> come down. So this is going to increase 
geometrical proportion in the coming days. So even that 15 to 20 percent of the oil and gas transportation shipping also will go away. And, and, and Michael only in one of the conversation told me that there are around 1200 VLCCs in operation today. Very large crude carrier. And every year there used to be 30, 40 new order. But last year in 2023, there's just one new order for a VLCC. Just imagine the impact which is taking place. So without taking much of uh, your time, Michael, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Reggie. Uh, thank you for having me. And thank you to the India Smart Grid Forum for inviting me. It's a privilege to share my perspective with you. Uh, India is facing the wicked problem of continuing to bring its most disadvantage out of poverty while simultaneously decarbonizing its economy. Uh, that requires low carbon economic growth, which thankfully isn't a paradox. Many of the historic pathways for economic growth were deeply wasteful and inefficient. They created a dependency on mining billions of tons of fossil fuels, mostly to be burned once at significant direct and indirect expense. But the future doesn't require that dependency. I hope over the next year, and starting with this material and the short list of climate actions that will work, and continuing with monthly discussions on specific topics, uh, to assist you somewhat in finding a better path for India. Uh, much of this will be familiar to you and much of it India is making good progress on, but it bears repeating in context of the whole. As Reggie said, the first action is electrify everything. Uh, my apologies for using United States Sankey diagram of energy flows. Um, I looked at the Indian ones. Uh, the American one illustrates a primary aspect, the best of all the Sankey diagrams I've looked at. Um, for context, Primary energy, solar, hydro, natural gas, coal, petroleum, comes in on the left-hand side, electrical generation. It goes through energy services, residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. And then you can see here that we have a very big box up here of what's called rejected energy. Rejected energy is waste heat, mostly. It's energy that was in the primary energy that does not do any good. It just goes away into the atmosphere. It's entropy. And virtually all of that rejected energy comes from fossil fuels. As we burn them, we get very little of the energy out of them in most, most cases. Unless we're using them directly for heat in a well-managed well system. By comparison, we consider renewables and nuclear um, then they are much more efficient going through electrified energy services and so we can reduce our emissions quite substantially. Uh, we can re reduce our rejected energy quite substantially. Now let's think of through this and I'll, I'll give you some numbers at the end but in this case the United States continues to run about a hundred thousand quadrillion BTUs, a hundred quadrillion BTUs uh, every year of energy and throws away two-thirds of it. Um, but if we electrify transportation, as you'll see, this gray bar of rejected energy is much larger than the dark bar of actual energy services. For cars and trucks, they're about 20% efficient well to wheel. 80% of energy for them is thrown away. Uh, while jets are, modern jets are miracles of efficiency, when they're running at uh, 38,000 feet and often in cruising speed, uh, they're 50% efficient. But when they're on the runway, it's like pouring kerosene on the, on the runway. Similarly, um, mar maritime shipping is very efficient when it's operating. Uh, but when it's sitting in a port with the uh, auxiliary power units generating, it's not doing very much. Now, as we electrify all those things, we can also ask, about, well, what about heat? And heat pumps are good for heat pumps and district heating and district cooling are good for all of commercial and residential heat needs. And those invert the uh, actual rejected energy. One unit of electricity for residential and commercial heat turns into three units of heat because we take two units of heat from the environment. And so the efficiency gains go up quite substantially. Now I did the work for the United States um, and I calculated if we did 
pulled all the electrification levers, um, how much primary energy would we require? And it dropped by 50%. A modern economy can require 50% less energy coming on the left to create all of the economic value, all of the comfort, all of the safety, and deliver all of the health benefits of, of energy uh, of a, you know, if, if we don't use fossil fuels for that purpose. And there's a whole bunch of ancillary benefits for that as well. Um, India is in a different position, and so it's going to be quite interesting. Now, uh, there are some of the ancillary benefits, as Reggie said, 40% of bulk shipping is fossil fuels today. Another 15% is raw iron ore. As such, we're going to see a significant reduction in maritime shipping and a significant reduction in the requirement for fossil fuels for maritime shipping. And that's true across the board. At present, roughly 11% of all energy in the world is consumed by the fossil fuel industry to extract, process, refine, and distribute fossil fuels. Uh, much of it is uh, in a gray economy where they extract and burn fossil fuels um, at lower efficiencies. And so, you know, with some of the unconventional oil extraction techniques have very low energy returns on investment these days as a result. Um, the point of this uh, is that India should as much as possible skip the fossil fuel aspects. Wherever possible, leap to renewables and electrified energy services to avoid paying that middleman of the fossil fuel industry uh, hand over fist for decades. Uh, every new coal plant that you build does commit you to a certain extent to continuing to pay for that coal energy. The next step, of course, is overbuild renewable generation. Uh, but that's quite a lot less overbuild in context of the overall solution than most realize. And you know, I'm speaking to the utilities of India. You've undoubtedly read the reports on this and read the various analyses. I am, as I say, repeating some stuff that's pretty obvious. Um, but there is a context here that's important. Uh, there is the, the historical legacy concept of baseload, which is more and more becoming obsolete. Um, it emerged out of local generation for local needs um, and typically a manufacturing base with ancillary benefits for residential and commercial lighting. And then it grew and grew and grew and grew bigger and grew bigger. Um, and now baseload is interfering as a concept with what we need, which is flexible and firmed electricity. Um, and that flexibility and firming is interesting. As we think of wind farms, we, we think of their capacity factors as being 35 to 40 percent. But in reality, they are delivering electricity 85 percent of the year. Uh, they're just delivering it at below their optimal um, generation rate. Similarly, solar, we think of their capacity factors as being well below that of wind. But you know, in New Delhi right now, they will start generating electricity at dawn and 12 hours later stop generating electricity as the sun falls. And so there is a curve of electrical generation for both of these, which is much broader than most people think of. We, we tend to think in professionally in capacity factors but the hours of generation is much greater than the capacity factor indicates. Um, as we overbuild wind and solar, those edge hours add up in ways which are not necessarily intuitive, but provide much more of the demand than we think of. Uh, with the other factors in the short list, a 25% overbuild of wind, solar, and water is sufficient for the majority of demands. And so we have to do some other work as well. And some of that work is building continent scale grids and markets, spreading uh, HVDC interconnects, especially broadly around the world. Uh, I, I like to say that high voltage direct current is a new pipeline. Um, and certainly a, a lot of other people are looking at it that way as well, because they're comparing hydrogen pipelines versus HVDC. And most of those reports are bad. They're um, framed poorly. They're framed um, in a way which is giving far too much benefit to hydrogen 
over electrons flowing down HVDC. And you know that. Um, I, I've spent some time looking at India's uh, stuff in preparation for this discussion. And you have more high voltage direct current uh, lines than the United States. Yeah, uh, right now, if my uh, data sources are accurate, about 10,000 kilometers of lines and 29 gigawatts of capacity uh, compared to the United States, 6,000 kilometers and 20 gigawatts. Further, you're already planning 8,000 kilometers of high voltage direct current and an additional 42,000 kilometers of high voltage um, alternating current. Uh, this is exactly the right stuff to be doing, enabling uh, electrons to flow from where they're generated to where they're needed um, over geographical distances. Um, the India is a very broad country, and so solar energy on one side of the country can be feeding high demand periods um, on the other side of the country quite usefully. And further, you're in a densely um, populated area with many opportunities for connecting to neighbors with HVDC. Uh, you know, some of these links that you can see on the screen, for example, from Australia up to Singapore as a potential. Uh, that one is much longer than for uh, some of the connections that you can make to neighbors. And you already have um, transmission interconnections with neighboring countries uh, today. So you're already doing much of the good work here and I'm acknowledging that and I'm you know, uh, saying, yeah, as I say, you, you know this and this is the right stuff to be doing. And you're already working on the market side of things with the proposed market-based and securities constrained economic dispatch models. So there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, you could be leaning more into some of these things. You could be accelerating them, but you're moving in the right direction um, and moving there in a way that's probably better than other some many other geographies. The next action is build pumped hydro and other storage. And when I say pumped hydro, I mean a specific type of pumped hydro. Uh, at present, there's some pumped hydro um, in Gujarat. There's a facility um, that is attached to a river dam. And so it's pumping water uphill when the, <clears throat> when the conditions are right for that. But the types of uh, pumped hydro I'm talking about are off river closed loop pumped hydro. And what that means is we find a site which has 400 meters or more vertical distance that has um, those sites within two to three kilometers of one another. And we build a reservoir at the top and a reservoir at the bottom and a tunnel between them off of rivers, off of any waterways. That model enables us to avoid the environmental impacts of damming rivers. Um, it enables us to have high vertical heights, which enables us to have high energy storage needs. Now, there is a plan right now for India to build more pumped hydro, 18.8 uh, gigawatts by 2032, um, out of an identified Indian resource of 106 gigawatts. Um, but this map is from the uh, Australian National University's GIS study of closed loop off river pumped hydro resource opportunities. Uh, there are, there is vastly more resource in this model of pumped hydro than most people realize. Um, as you can see, it's densely clustered near the very populous northern part of uh, India close to New Delhi, where most of the delegates are sitting today. And there's a strong opportunity to lean much further into pumped hydro. It is a resource that um, India is blessed with capacity for. Um, India, and you already know that it's the largest form of electrical generation in the world, or electrical storage in the world. That's just going to continue. Um, and we can see that very clearly. Uh, one of the things that I'd say is, if we want to see what works economically, look to what China is doing at massive scale. Typically they've run the numbers and they try to do, uh, they end up building one of everything, but they build a lot of the stuff that works. Now China already has 19 gigawatts of pumped hydro in operation and 365 gigawatts under construction or planned for 2030. Um, that's an indicator. 
Now, the United States, by comparison, has only 10 older pumped hydro sites and um, only one under construction. So pumped hydro is a dominant way to firm electricity. Now, one of the things that uh, people tend to say was not every place is blessed with the right geography. Well, uh, as we can see, India is. Uh, but secondarily, it's a grid asset. It doesn't need to be near the city that it's serving. Um, when I spoke to China Light and Power, the Hong Kong's utility, a couple of years ago, we were talking about their Guangdong province pumped hydro facility. It's 120 kilometers straight line away on the mainland of China. It's a lights out facility. It can provide up to 12 hours of electricity for to power all of Hong Kong. Um, and it's not right beside the city or in the city. And so as we think about it, we can think about building transmission to and from it and taking advantage of this natural battery. The next action is plant a lot of trees. Um, when I spoke to the Swiss uh, researcher who did this study, this uh, graphic came from a few years ago, um, he was pointing out that we used to have about 6 trillion trees on Earth. We've cut down half of that. Um, if we return a trillion trees to the Earth, we have a significant but slow carbon drawdown solution that basically just sits there and does its job and provides other co-benefits of cooler air, reduced air pollution, reduced particulate pollution, um, and a bunch of stuff like that. But when we say plant a lot of trees, when I say plant a lot of trees, I also mean return lands to grasslands where possible, restore wetlands, and restore coastal vegetation. Now, in India's case, um, as the mangroves of India um, were our natural, our natural treasure, and 40% of them are gone. Now, in the age of increased climate, uh, extreme weather, um, and increased sea level rise, mangroves provide strong coastal benefits. They moderate the force of winds coming off the ocean. They moderate storm surge. They slow waves and reduce coastal erosion. And so there's a strong benefit to um, finding nature-based solutions for carbon drawdown. Um, when I look at global carbon drawdown solutions, I, I find a stark contrast between countries which export fossil fuels and countries which do not export fossil fuels. Countries who export fossil fuels um, in inevitably have mechanical and industrial carbon capture and sequestration high on their list of items, and countries which do not have uh, fossil fuel export economies um, all have nature-based carbon drawdown solutions. Um, and so we start to think about why it is that that is. Um, but to be clear, nature-based or mechanical and industrial carbon capture solutions and carbon drawdown solutions are not going to help us with our 2050 goals. They are going to help us with 2100 and 2200 goals for reducing the long-term impacts of global warming. Aligned with this is changing agricultural practices. Uh, India still has um, quite a number of small farms and a, quite a lot of small uh, manual labor on in its industry. Um, and aggregating smaller fields into bigger fields and then automating is a strong efficiency gain. Now, India is already the biggest market for tractors in the world by a factor of five, um, but in some cases that's catching up with the rest of the world. Tractors still only work a fraction of India's fields. But this drone is here for a reason. Large, we're now in an era where large-scale heavy lift drones carrying up to 200 pounds of product can be, can be um, seeding fields and spraying fields electrically powered, um, a couple of drones, a couple of big drones can cover as much field with product as a 700,000 John Deere modern tractor uh, in a day. And they run off electricity. They're carrying vastly less weight than the tractor. And they're not compacting the fields, compressing the soil with their wheels. A as such, they can go over fields that are wet, including rice paddies. They can apply product to rice paddies 
to eliminate fungus and to eliminate pests during the growing season much more effectively than non-approaches. And because they're uh, GPS controlled, there is and, and have visual sensors, they have a much greater ability to provide um, precision agriculture, putting only the product that is required where it is necessary. Studies show that you can get um, with if you're applying herbicides, pesticides, uh, fungicides, and fertilizer with drones, because of the nature of the prop wash pushing the product down into the fields and the lack of overspray, it's a 30 to 50 percent reduction in products for the same crop yields. This is a strong efficiency benefit. Where these things are available, farmers are buying them not because of the climate benefits, not because of avoiding runoff, not because of avoiding burning diesel, but simply because they're cheaper. They produce better crop yields at less expense. And India can leapfrog in, in, in agriculture to much more drone-based approaches. Similarly, low tillage agriculture reduces breaking up the underground uh, network of mushroom, mushrooms and other things, which draw down carbon over time and keep it under the fields. But by reducing tillage in those approaches and using more drone-based things, uh, agriculture's carbon emissions become carbon drawdown opportunities. Uh, we also have some other technologies there. Um, agrogenetics enables us to do nitrogen fixing in the fields, nitrogen being the key building block for plants. One to 5% of a plant's mass is made from nitrogen. And most of that nitrogen these days comes from uh, artificial ammonia made from natural gas or coal. Oh, well, making that, uh, making that, um, making that fertilizer from hydrogen is clearly an obvious solution, but so is using um, agrogenetics to enhance the ability of microbes already in the soil to fix nitrogen themselves. Pivot Bio out of the United States is doing that. They've got millions of acres of corn in the United States under uh, under their product, and they're reducing um, fertilizer requirements by 25% already, and they have a strong expectation of growing. And so the emissions of agriculture and the effort and expense of agriculture can be diminished. And the labor of agriculture that is currently done by humans can be more and more done by drones and automation, enabling those people to provide more productive services to India's economy. Of course, also have to fix concrete, steel, and industrial processes. Um, now, India, as you undoubtedly know, has been growing its steel industry massively. Uh, as of last year, uh, China, of course, was number one um, and had half of all the steel manufacturing in the world. But India was number two, um, and it surpassed the United Kingdom and the United States in terms of steel production, about 100 million tons um, uh, a year, if memory serves. Now, there's also a strong opportunity here for further electrification, as Reggie said. Um, right now, India is at 54% of using scrap steel and electric arc furnaces. Uh, that's compared to the EU's 40%. The EU's lagging badly on this metric. The USA has been at 70% for 20 years. And so as we think through what a, an advanced economy might look like, we see a very significant increase in electric arc furnaces scrapping old infrastructure. As Reggie said, as we think about that very large crude carrier, as we think about the 912 of them that are floating around in the oceans, uh, well, they're surplus for requirements and all the steel in those furnaces and all the steel in those ships becomes steel which can be used in a more productive way for our economies. Similarly, the, the pipelines carrying natural gas and oil around our planet are also going to become mostly surplus for requirements and can become, you know, things we just dig up and put into uh, electric arc furnaces. I worked out um, not too long ago that in, for the United States, about four years steel requirements are embodied in their pipelines if they were dug up and put into electric arc furnaces. But there's more opportunities that while while 75 percent of steel requirements are likely to be able to be met by scrapping 
Um, that's still 25% of new steel that's required, both for quality requirements and for growth. And so, you know, right now, blast furnaces are a major factor in India, um, but we have some alternatives already. Uh, globally, 100 million tons of steel is manufactured from using direct reduction of iron using synthetic gases. Um, it's a process which Midrex and other technologies use, and they create synthetic gases, add heat, add process heat, and create uh, iron out of iron ore, and then steel out of the iron uh, without coal. Now, the advantage here is that the process heat can be provided by electricity, and the synthetic gases can come from biological sources of methane. And so the great biomass waste that India has today can be used to create the steel of tomorrow in a low carbon way. There's a strong opportunity to move there. Now this is technology that's available today and is entirely possible to build today. And then we have the technologies that are emerging. Uh, you know, Reggie mentioned green hydrogen and green hydrogen reduction of steel. It's the one growth area I see for uh, hydrogen demand uh, actually. Um, the, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, Boston Metals and Fortescue are exper experimenting with electrochemical reduction of uh, iron without the requirement for any external reducing agent, basically stripping the uh, ions off uh, to de-rust uh, iron ore, uh, just using electricity and pH-balanced chemistry pr processes. Um, I have uh, a fairly strong belief that those combination of technologies will work. Um, if you know the statistics I have indicate that India has 127 iron mines producing 282 million tons of steel a year. Now, shifting that as rapidly as possible to more electrified production um, has another co-benefit. Right now, you have a strong reliance on Australian coking coal. Uh, the high high quality metallurgical coal for your blast furnaces. You could reduce your imports and generate a lot more of the energy and reduction of steel from locally produced resources. Now, similarly for cement, another core industrial product, well, electrification of limestone kilns uh, that turn limestone into quicklime, a key ingredient of cement, is entirely viable. Um, there were uh, electrified limestone kilns 100 years ago. Uh, it's just the cheap price of fossil fuels, which has made them unprofitable. And so we have that opportunity. We can also uh, electric, uh, the cement, the rotating cement clinker kilns can be electrified. Um, and this is one of the few places where I say carbon capture might have advantages. When we uh, bake limestone into quicklime, it does emit CO2 from the process of being heated in the presence of oxygen, and that carbon dioxide is fairly pure. It's a great place to slap on some carbon capture. But there are other cement opportunities emerging as well that just haven't been cost-effective up until now. And of course, also electrification of industrial heat. As Reggie said, we have electrification technologies for every temperature of heat. Um, we just need to apply them. Um, this is a significant increase Every time we, when I talk to global heating experts from or companies like Cantel, every time we electrify heat in industry, we find efficiencies because typically we see a lot more waste heat that is um, in, inappropriately applied or more broadly applied. So there's some real opportunities there. Of course, uh, pricing carbon aggressively is critical. Um, you know, this, this rising curve this accelerating curve of emissions as, um, as recorded at the Mauna Loa Observatory um, is indicative that we have some problems. Right now, we're at a point where <clears throat> the United, United States, Canada, and uh, Europe have agreed and harmonized on the social cost of carbon. And right now, it's about 194 US dollars per tonne. It's growing to about 300 to just under 300 US dollars per ton by 2040. That means that every extra ton of carbon dioxide we emit or equivalent 
is costing the world hundreds of dollars. Um, but we're not pricing it there yet. Uh, a carbon price, a strong price on carbon, is the biggest broom for climate change. Uh, but it has to be a formal, regulated carbon price. Um, India's current carbon market is voluntary and hence inadequate. And so there's a strong opportunity to improve that. Right now, India is also exporting cheap carbon credits to um, rich, con richer countries, <clears throat> and that's a mistake. Uh, if the carbon credits actually have value, uh, they can't be double counted according to global standards that have emerged out of the, uh, the, the climate conferences. And so India will have to buy those back at the social cost of carbon in 2040 and 2050 if it wants to meet its climate goals. So any dependence of any, any carbon credits you sell now cheaply <clears throat> to the developed world are lost to you or the firms and, and regions which have sold them are going to have to break those contracts. So there's a, a there's a something coming down the pipe, which is that. I, I've spent a fair amount of time talking with Dr. Joe Rom um, about this subject. He uh, Just before COP28, we were discussing his papers on this subject. I urge you to look them up. Now, India's fuel excise tax is good, but it doesn't cover industry or power. Um, as we think through this, we start getting into the question about, well, what is a good carbon price? And the EU, the your Economic Union, it really does have the best carbon pricing structure on the planet, but it's emerging. Um, Canada's is slightly better, but lower priced. Um, but EU is, is avoiding the, is reducing the problems with it. Um, now their carbon pricing guidance, as I've worked out scenarios, makes all gas and coal plants unprofitable compared to renewables. So that drives the shift. Um, don't have to do more than just price the, the uh, coal and natural gas that's going into those things for their emissions. Similarly, in Canada, uh, in Alberta, the carbon price by 2030 would have made coal four times more expensive for electrical generation. And so Alberta shut down its coal plants seven years ahead of their intended shutdown. As we think across the world, China has a carbon market and it's making it stronger and making it more expensive. 12 US states have a carbon price. The EU has a carbon price. And now the EU is bringing in the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, as we think about that carbon border adjustment mechanism, it is every country which exports to Europe is now going to be effectively paying the EU's carbon price on, their, on what they send to them. And the geographies which already have a carbon price get to discount that. Uh, right now, instead of embracing carbon pricing, um, India is fighting the carbon border adjustment me uh, mechanism with the World Trade Organization. So there's an opportunity for India to do better around carbon pricing, to accelerate decarbonization, and avoid that trap of falling into um, that long-term dependency on fossil fuels. Uh, the next action is to pro, you know, proactively shut down the worst of coal and gas and oil plants. Now, uh, as we look at this, this is a chart which talks about some of the implications of burning coal and oil for energy. Um, on the left-hand side of this graph, there is a real problem, which is that um, coal, while it provides electricity, uh, kills a lot more people due to accidents and air pollution. Uh, my statistics say that every coal plant kills about 80 people a year. And so as we think about that, the people are dying because of emphysema and other lung diseases. And those people are less productive as they're moving away. Moving away from high pollution forms of energy increases economic productivity of a country of its, its human resources. And so there's a real thread to follow through there. You know, uh, and India is struggling with this um, as China is, uh, as the developing world is, because the benefits of generating electricity are very strong. Um, but the disadvantages of generating it from coal and oil are also very strong. Now, um, 
accelerating the um, renewables generation, as India is doing, is strongly advantageous. Building the, the uh, transmission that India is doing is strongly advantageous. This is stuff that you know, and it's that balancing act. How, and this is a challenging one for every country. Um, and so it's one of the places where there's room to accelerate as much as possible. Um, but I'm certainly not going to be judging you for making sure that you have electricity for lights and hospitals and stuff like that. But that said, there are worse and better coal and oil plants. Um, if you characterize the coal and oil plants by quality and then have a national strategy to shut down the worst ones first, the most polluting ones first, the highest emission ones first, and replace them with more efficient modern plants, then that's a, an advantage. Then you start to see that. Now, there's something else to think about from an economic perspective. Coal capacity uh, factors and oil capacity factors and gas capacity factors will diminish over time as more renewables come on. And so there's a problem with any investment in coal and oil is that there's a strong risk that become stranded assets. As you electrify your economy and reduce primary energy requirements, the demand on those will go down. We're seeing this in uh, the United States and China today. Uh, China uses its coal the way the United States uses its natural gas. Both of them are under 50% capacity factors annually. They are not baseload generation. The merit order says use them last. And so they see a diminishing, um, there's a strong downward curve for the capacity factors of their generation assets. But yet they also must be preserved for strategic reserves for electricity um, as you build out your storage and transmission. And so one of the question marks that I don't have an answer to, and I, I hope to discuss in the coming year, is what is India's natural na our national strategy to preserve fossil fuel generation assets that would be economically unprofitable in the end game of decarbonization, but must be preserved until they're no longer needed, until there's sufficient storage of other types. Um, then, of course, there's an obvious one, stop financing and subsidies for fossil fuels. Um, right now, uh, as of 2022, the IMF indicated that India was providing $32 billion U.S. of subsidies to fossil fuels and $314 billion, um, including indirect uh, subsidies. That's the negative externalities of mortality and uh, climate change. Uh, that was 10% of the GDP in 2022. In 2023, because of the energy crisis in preceding years and the price caps on energy that India put in for very good reasons um, to prevent energy poverty among its populace, uh, that subsidy actually jumped up to 39 billion. And so obviously going the wrong way. And so India you know, must next work hard to drive that down. Now, there's good news as we go through transition. The more renewables there are in grids, the cheaper the wholesale cost of electricity is most of the time. And so more and more uh, uh, renewables and transmission and storage in India stabilizes energy prices. More electrification will stabilize energy prices. But we, will, we are going through a period of additional volatility during the transition and during the geopolitics around the trend transition. Now, according to the IMF data, uh, coal and diesel are about 50% of the price of an efficient market cost in India. And so adjusting the price points on coal and diesel to make them more effectively priced against comparisons is a strong lever. Now, typically a carbon price will do that, but that can also be a regulated price. Uh, it's similar to the fuel excise tax, fuel excise taxes, uh, there are other regulatory levers that can be pulled. Uh, next action is hydrofluorocarbons. Um, a few decades ago, uh, we discovered that the uh, a predicted event was occurring. Uh, a scientist had said, what are the impacts of chlorofluorocarbons on our uh, uh, atmosphere? And he, and he said, it's probably going to be causing destruction of ozone. And so research was done and they put up uh, satellites and other things, and they found, yes, indeed, there's a growing hole in the ozone layer. 
um, and that was significantly problematic for the Southern Hemisphere. And so the, Kigali, the Montreal uh, Protocol on Substances Which Harm the Ozone Layer was uh, created and signed globally, and the world moved from chlorofluorocarbons to hydrofluorocarbons. Um, and that was advantageous for the ozone layer. Uh, but at the time, there's probably somebody like me who's putting up their hand saying, uh, excuse me, uh, hydrofluorocarbons are strong greenhouse gases, thousands of times stronger than carbon dioxide. Uh, you know, standard refrigerants like R410A are 4,390 times more powerful over 20 years, and they persist for uh, hundreds of years in the atmosphere. So in 2015, the world gathered in uh, Kigali in Rwanda and formalized the, Rwanda, the Kigali Amendment, and India is signatory to the Kigali Amendment. Um, that amendment says we're going to phase out hydrofluorocarbons for things which have low, for refrigerants which have low global warming potentials. Uh, hydro, um, HFOs, uh, believe it or not, carbon dioxide is used significantly in, as a refrigerant uh, these days, especially for, um, for you know, it's for more industrial scale uh, cooling and for uh, hot water. Uh, we can have a lot of um, heat pumps for hot water use CO2. Uh, but this is a place where India being signatory is lagging. Um, uh, for reasons that are related to geopolitics and export, China has taken a much more aggressive stance um, on phasing out hydrofluorocarbons than India has. Uh, the analysis I read indicated that was due to uh, China's much greater focus on exports uh, and the uh, India's much greater focus on a domestic market for HFCs. Uh, but this is a place where India is lagging when it could be leading. Uh, as we look at the global statistics, um, there's the Carbon Drawdown Project. And Carbon Drawdown Project did a ranking by business case. What is the cheapest way to have the highest environmental impact? And reducing HFCs was the cheapest thing that could be done. So this is a place I would urge India to spend more time and effort reducing its HFCs. So those are the things which we should do. And now I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, things which are distractions and should be reduced in terms of the discussion. And Reggie mentioned one of them already, but let's start with nuclear generation. Now, uh, as a proud Canadian, I know that uh, India's uh, nuclear reactor fleet are Kandus, um, and they've served you well. They're only about 3% of your electrical generation per year, according to the statistics I have. And I will say, as a proud Canadian, I would not recommend buying more candus. Um, they have been uh, ignored as a technology. They languished. The uh, assets are now in the hands of a, a company that I would not um, choose to do business with. Um, and it's not a, a great technology anymore. Um, and so we have um, a situation where the question is, I, I like nuclear generation in general. But in liking nuclear generation, that doesn't mean that it's competitive with renewables. Now, for a decade, I've been looking at the natural experiment playing out in China. In the late 1990s, they established a nuclear program. In the mid 2000s, they established a wind and solar program. And so I've been looking at those since 20, and I've been recording data since 2010 about how much actual generation they've been putting in of those two technologies. Now, their nuclear program peaked in 2016 and 2018. Um, that was when they added the most capacity. It was seven gigawatts each year. And since then, they've been flatlining. They've been diminishing. Uh, they've averaged under three gigawatts of new capacity a year since then. It's all good capacity. It's going to be running at 90, 91% capacity factors, providing low carbon, uh, low pollution electricity. Um, but it's almost a rounding error compared to that white line. That's wind, water, and solar additions of actual terawatt hours. That's the annual addition. And so if you think about the compounding error here, the vertical bar, um, the accelerating bar of renewables 
is practically straight up compared to nuclear. And so you know, we think about this, the, the natural experiment is being played out and the country which knows how to build infrastructure, knows how to build technology at large scale, clearly can scale renewables more than it can scale nuclear um, at that point. Now, some of this is because um, of the costs of mega projects and the risks associated with mega projects. Uh, I recommend anybody who hasn't read How Big Things Get Done by Professor Bent Flobjerg um, and Dan Gardner, uh, pick that up. Um, he has a uh, data, data set of over 16,000 mega projects, uh, projects that cost over a billion dollars uh, and globally. <clears throat> and what he's categorized them into 25 categories. Uh, nuclear generation is only worse than the Olympics and building nuclear waste facilities in terms of uh, risks. Uh, so it is 23rd on the, 20, uh, on the list of 25 in terms of cost overruns and long-tailed risks. Uh, many more things go wrong with nuclear programs. Meanwhile, wind, solar, and transmission are in the top four by likelihood to achieve budget and schedule once construction starts. The risks associated with building wind, water, nuclear, uh, wind, water, transmission, um, and solar are much lower than building nuclear energy. And we can't wait. Um, so, oops. as we think about that, that's due to the risks uh, and the conditions for success. Similarly, there's a lot of buzz around small modular reactors right now. Uh, and the modular reactors are interesting. So, the conditions for success for a scaled nuclear program, which many countries have done in the past, is it be a national major strategy and budget. There's military weapons alignment for nuclear weapons. It's a nationally run human resources program to create the certified and secured um, resources. Uh, only one to two reactor designs are built. They're at gigawatt scale for the efficiencies of, of that technology. And it's a two to three decade program. Well, small modular reactors don't align with the, most of those conditions for success. And, and so I do not consider them a wise choice to be betting on um, in any numbers. Now, wisely, India didn't sign up for the COP28 nuclear pledge. Uh, unfortunately, it also didn't sign up for the renewables pledge, and that was due to the, uh, the, the added feature of the, um, that pledge around coal generation. Uh, I, I, obviously, India is pledging to expand renewables substantially um, and is finding its own path through this, this process. Um, the next one is hydrogen for energy. Reggie mentioned hydrogen for energy. Uh, this is one of the things I do is I do projections through 2060 or 2100 of major climate areas and their solution spaces. Uh, this is the demand projection for hydrogen through 2100. Uh, as you'll see, it's falling. Uh, and this is a heterodox projection. It's clearly not aligned with what a lot of uh, countries thought was going to happen with hydrogen because they thought they could just replace one set of molecules with another set of molecules and they'd manufacture them with renewables. And of course, everybody's now figuring out that it would take three times as much electrical generation or more to generate those molecules than just using the electricity directly. And that bloom is falling off that rose. Uh, but the bump in the, on this, that's steel. This growth area here is steel and it's not guaranteed. As I said, there is um, the Midrex biomethanol, <clears throat> biomethane synthetic gas uh, thread. There's the um, direct electrochemical thread. That's the only growth area I see. Uh, much of this, for context, um, a full third of global demand for hydrogen today is in oil refineries. Uh, and that's going to be going away. And it's going to be going away much more quickly than most people realize because the majority of hydrogen used in refineries is used on the um, heaviest and most sulfur-filled oils out of places like Mexico, Venezuela, and uh, Canada, Alberta. And so those are gonna be first off the market as they're required to decarbonize and clean up with more expensive hydrogen. So don't spend a lot of time on hydrogen for energy. You, it's not fit for purpose for uh, transportation. It's much more expensive for, as a source of heat 
it doesn't have a place in commercial or residential buildings and we have direct electrical solutions for most heat and where we need a burnable gas once again biologically sourced methane is probably more suitable and cheaper uh, carbon capture and sequestration is another distraction uh, this is a graphic i created years ago we have about 3,000 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere about a thousand billions of tons of that have been added by us since the start of the industrial revolution and we're still adding 35 to 41 billion tons annually and then this invisible dot down here like this is the 35 to 41 but there's an invisible dot down there our total market for all carbon dioxide in our economy is about 230 million tons about 0.58 percent of a year's emissions of co2 we're not going to grow that by orders and orders and orders of magnitude to either reduce to counter the 35 to 40 billion tons or to start drawing down a thousand billion tons. Um, now, further, of that 230 million tons, 90 million tons of that is used for enhanced oil recovery, mostly in the United States. And so as we think about that, what they're actually doing is they're taking geologically stored carbon dioxide that is associated with natural gas they're stripping that off and they're piping it a few kilometers or miles and they're pumping it back underground to produce more oil. A vast majority of the carbon capture and sequestration that is touted today by ExxonMobil and other countries is actually a shell game. Um, it's not something that can scale. Once again, nature-based solutions are a much more effective uh, approach to this. And that applies to direct air capture and air fuels. A direct air capture where you use walls of fans, um, just are, are thermodynamic nonsense, and they are fig leaves for the fossil fuel industry. It's quite remarkable. Um, and the uh, just taking the example, it, it is a case where we're trying to close the gate after the horse has already escaped. Um, imagine, if you will, a huge beach of black sand. And in that beach, there are 420 gray grains of sand. And every day, someone is throwing another grain into the sand. And your job is to find those 420 grains and remove a third of them. Uh, that's what carbon direct air capture is like. It's just not effective. Uh, one of the leading companies in that place, Carbon Engineering, now owned by Occidental, the major oil company, um, has to get a million tons of CO2 a year, which is a a rounding error on the scale of the problem requires two kilometers of fans 20 meters high and three meters thick and they power it by burning natural gas uh, it would getting to uh, anything appropriate scale would wrap around the equator and finally pay attention to motivations um, this transition that we're going through globally is a huge transformation of our economy there are losers, and most of them know who they are. And there are winners, and some of them know who they are. And there are a lot of people who want to be winners. Uh, electrolyzer firms really want to be winners, um, and they're going to be OK. Hydrogen fuel cell bus companies and hydrogen fuel cell manufacturers want to be winners. They're not going to be. Um, the oil and gas industry wants to convert its hydrocarbons into hydrogen. And so they want to preserve that extraction of molecules from underground. And that's not going to work out well for them. Um, gas utilities have a vested interest in preserving their business case against the, against, against the utility death spiral. The big consultancies are, they work for who pays them and they give the results that they expect. And so as we think about this, if you hear something that sounds potentially like it, might be a great idea find out why the person is talking about it um and if they are clearly have a vested interest they'd be at least skeptical and so you know a lot of the green hydrogen stuff doesn't stand up to scrutiny um economically technically and it, we start to see where the push for it is coming from um you know small modular reactors similar types of things and so that's the end of the short list of climate actions that will work. Um, Reggie, um, you know, happy to take questions if you have time for that.
thank you michael uh, and anybody any questions girish rahul there's a mic here interesting talk and of course the wedges are well known as they're called uh, or portfolio approach in the power sector that you need a lot of things. Can you say a little bit about developing countries in the sense that they are a little different from the developed world when we look at these trajectories. They're further down the curve in the sense India's net zero is planned for 2070 while Europe should ideally do 2035 or 2040 to give some carbon space for developing regions, for example. So is it that there are, I mean, the favorite buzzword is leapfrog, and it's not entirely clear that that's available equally everywhere, or do you really think that there is some of that? Or are the development constraints such that it's okay to wait a little and there's too much to choose from? There's certainly some no-brainers, electrifying everything and so forth, but can you speak a little bit more on the nuances of a country like India or even more so countries in Africa? Because their needs and objectives and aspirations aren't exactly 100% the same. When you talked of a very high carbon price in, in the US, the societal cost of carbon for parts of Africa, if you do sub-national, national accounting, is much lower. Thank you. Um, certainly. Uh, I'll lead into a few bits of that. Um, so let's take one specific piece in terms of leapfrogging and explore. Um, let's just take electrifying transportation. <clears throat> um, right now, uh, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance um, pulled some numbers together last year, and they found that um, we're already seeing millions of barrels of oil a year avoided. Uh, but the interesting thing that was the biggest source of avoidance of burning oil was two and three wheeled small electric vehicles, almost entirely in the developing world. Um, uh, certainly in my travels in Indonesia and Malaysia, um, sometimes on uh, you know, gasoline burning uh, scooters, uh, there were numbers, uh, tremendous numbers of tiny vehicles there. And they weren't cheap. They were cheap in one way to run, but a battery electric one was also cheap and very effective, very efficient, and very low maintenance. And so now let's lean into that maintenance thing. Um, India, for example, has pledged to put 50,000 electric buses on its roads by 20, uh, 2027. Um, and you know, when I talked to Reggie and looked through some of the work that's already been done, there's been a great work in terms of India in terms of right-sizing the batteries for the routes, and so avoiding the northern and, and avoiding the developed world's trap of falling into it must be as good as a diesel bus is today, as opposed to it must be sufficient for the needs of the route. And so um, India has a lot more electric buses than it would otherwise because it did that analysis and said we don't need something that um, California thinks is absolutely perfect. We need something that works for us. And so that enables a secondary benefit of electrification to occur. Uh, the global statistics on electric buses versus diesel buses versus gasoline buses are that electric buses are lower maintenance and they're cheaper to operate. And so as we, and that's cheaper than diesel. Now there's the purchase price, which India is doing um, an effective job of right sizing the bus size batteries. Um, and so that is another way to achieve that. But that is a place where you're leapfrogging other countries. Uh, 50,000 electric buses is more than North America will have in 2027. It's more than Europe will probably have in 2027. Your, Europe only has uh, you know, a couple of thousand electric buses now. It was 4,000, I think, at last count. Um, and further, this is another place where hydrogen is problematic. Hydrogen has maintenance costs that are 50% higher than diesel buses and fuel costs that are much higher. 
And so as we think through this, there's definite places where you can leapfrog it, and the developing world already is by electrifying the smallest transportation. Um, you know, electric vehicles are problematic in the developed world because we want cars that will drive 500 kilometers and have air conditioning and have cruise control and have all those things. Whereas, you know, a small family in India um, has a scooter or two, and that's a much more accessible form factor to electrify. And so some of that leapfrogging is places where you can strongly lean into the um, different uh, expectations of your populace. And, and even there, there's really fascinating stuff like Tata's nano car uh, relative failure was a fascinating case study in getting that wrong. And so, you know, India has a tremendous amount there. Now for Sub-Saharan Africa, um, I look at Sub-Saharan Africa differently than many people do. I've spent time analyzing and I've spent time analyzing a lot of um, electricity and decarbonization opportunities in various African countries. But like India, I do not pretend to be an expert. Thank you. Um, just a statistic for you. In uh, 2023, in India, 56% of three-wheelers sold were electric. So what you're saying is exactly, exactly right. And for yep. three-wheelers and no, two-wheelers, we uh, already have, uh, I mean, it, by law, it can be sold without batteries. Batteries being considered as fuel. So this is another pioneering work by ISGF. We been arguing that three-wheeler and two-wheeler should be sold without batteries, and batteries should be leased from battery leasing agencies, and that has given <coughs> rise to the battery swapping <coughs> station. So we have a challenge with the standardization of the battery swapping station, but that is becoming, there are already over a dozen battery swapping operators in, and we <coughs> made a draft standard, but we couldn't finalize it. There are some issues which we hope we'll be able to solve this year. And uh, thank you very much, Michael. And each of this, uh, what we have decided is that we are launching next month a webinar series, maybe bi-weekly, one session, almost an hour-long session on each of the slides which Michael was explaining, we will do. So that will be a real deep dive. People can ask questions. And many of the slides, you didn't have a chance to ask questions. We'll be able to do that. Someday, middle of April onwards, we will start with that. So Michael, thank you very much. Sorry to delay your flight. And uh, look forward to seeing you in India soon. I, I hope to get down there too, Reggie. And thank you to everybody for um, you know attending to uh, my perspective. I, I do hope to help India find the best possible path through the difficult coming decades.